First of all, today we want to talk about the differential scanning calorimetry in combination with Raman spectroscopy. And here we go. Uh, that's me, Michael Geller. I'm product specialist uh, for calorimetry. And I'm working for Linzeis since 2017. And you can, if you want to uh, get in touch, we can uh, link. In, we are linked in by mail or, of course, you can give me a call here. Uh, so this is Linzeis Messgeräte GmbH. We are founded in 1956 by Dr. Maximilian Linzeis here in Selb in Bavaria, Germany. We manufacture in Selb. Uh, of course, we have our own sales and service locations uh, all over the world uh, here in USA, China, and more than 65 uh, traders worldwide. So here on the right side, you can see Mr. Maximilian Linzeis and uh, our current management with uh, Klaus Linzeis, Florian Linzeis, and the newest one, Vincent Linzeis. And what's, uh, what's our topic? Uh, we manufacture measuring instruments for thermal analysis, thermal conductivity, and thermal electric materials. Of course, we also have our service measurement lab uh, here in Selp. So if there's an, an investigation, uh, you want to perform, it's possible to do this directly in Germany. And regarding the devices we manufacture here, uh, yeah, short overview. Uh, what we have here is, of course, the differential scanning calorimetry, but also thermogravimetry, so a TGA, the simultaneous thermal analysis, the STA, so the combination of uh, DSC and TGA. We have dilatometers thermomechanical analysis, thermal conductivity and diffusivity. And I already mentioned that also analyzers for thermoelectric materials, thin film analyzers, Hall effect, and many, many special instruments to our customers' needs. Uh, but today, of course, we want to focus on the differential scanning calorimetry, uh, especially on our chip DC. And so, this is something I I, I want to uh, give some information before everything else uh, about the chip DSC because this is a uh, yeah special DSC. Um, on the left side here, you can see the surrounding oven. This is the classic layout, a surrounding oven, and inside you can find uh, the sample side and the reference side with two temperature sensors. And yeah, what uh, what we've done with the DSC here is we've converted that layout to a vertical layout. And so now everything is inside our measurement cell. Uh, we have the heater in the middle of our sensor. We have a fixed reference site at the bottom with the temperature sensor. And on the top side, we have the sample itself, of course, also with the temperature sensor here. And so everything is uh, within a ceramic monolith, and this contains all of the parts we need for the DSC measurement itself. You can see it here at the bottom. On the left side, we have the sensor, so it's pretty small, as you can see here. And uh, through the small measurement cell design, we have the capability to yeah, produce a really small DSC here, you can see in the mid. And on the right side, of course, we also have the bigger version for more options we can use here. So uh, this is the theoretics of the DSC. So this is the heat flow we measure. So we measure two different temperatures. On one hand, uh, the temperature of the sample, and on the other hand, uh, the reference temperature. And if something happens to the sample side, for example, we have a melting, so an endothermic effect, um, uh, then we can see a temperature difference here. And this is basically what we measure because there will be a heat flow uh, from sample side to reference side or from reference side to sample side. And this is how a DSC works basically. And uh, with our chip DSC sensor, the wiring or the sensors are looking more or less like this. As I mentioned, we have a symmetric uh, layout here. Really in the mid, we have the heater. And on the top side, we have the sample. And on the bottom, we have the reference side. And through 
the symmetric layout we have, uh, yeah, we can see a defined heat flow here uh, because the temperatures are basically um, the same under inert conditions. The sensor itself is manufactured in thick film technique. And as I mentioned, uh, what we don't have here is uh, a reference side with a crucible and something aside, for example. We just have the fixed reference, and therefore, there's not so much effort for our measurement here. So it's really easy to use in this case. Um, we have also different sensor types here. So what you can see here is uh, on the upper left side, we have the low mass sensor, so it's a really, really small sensor for fastest transitions. And then on the right side here, we have the standard sensor that's um, yeah, suitable for the really most application. But we have also the high sensitivity sensor here, the thickest sensor we offer. And uh, this is, yeah, works pretty well for some things like glass transitions or smaller effects. So, of course, we can add some things to our DSC. This is something I want to show you because we are talking about one of these attachments today. And, uh, but, of course, we have many more options we can use here. Uh, so, we have the Raman spectrometer we want to talk about today. But we have also a big option or a UV light option, high pressure option. Of course, we have a sample robot, we have different cooling options uh, from liquid nitrogen over intracooler up to uh, cooling options. So this depends on the investigations. And so there are many attachments um, we can use here. So the application reaches from a simple uh, quality control application uh, from polymers of foods up to research. Uh, yeah, with some maybe some more complex devices with a Raman spectrometer, for example. And what can we see with a DSC, basically? So here you can see an example. Uh, in this case, I think it's PET. Um, with a conventional DSC measurement, we can see, uh, uh, for example, a glass transition here in the beginning. Uh, maybe with an overlaying hysteresis peak, we have the exothermic cold crystallization, uh, the melting TM, and um, after that, for example, this depends on the gas you're using, the oxidation or the thermal degradation. And this is just the heating run. Also, during the cooling run, we can see some things, for example, the crystallization itself or the glass transition also. And as I mentioned, sometimes there are some overlaying uh, phenomena we can determine also with the DSC. But later, I want to have some ideas about that. And so this is also the PET measurement performed with our device. And here we've used also the attachment with the video option. So you can see the changes uh, of the shape of our sample and uh, at the end of the measurement you can also see a small oxidation here on the right side of the crucible and this is what we can see with our chip dsc here so we have the glass transition we have the hysteresis or relaxation peak we have the uh, recrystallization the cold crystallization and of course the melting Of course, it's not just the polymer and it's not just a PET all the time we can measure. So we have several types for uh, and investigations for dynamic applications. So here in this case, uh, just a comparison of plant oils uh, with different melting peaks with corn oil, walnut oil, pumpkin seed oil, and so on. So what we can see here is it's possible to uh, differ the different oil types due to their melting. And what we can also see, sometimes the melting peaks are pretty broad. And uh, if you have a mixture, it's also sometimes not that easy to determine what's, uh, what's the oil we are using here. Another option could be butter, for example, uh, butter and margarine. So of course, in the beginning, we have all the time the water content here. So it's possible, for example, to determine the water content. 
and uh, different fatty acids we can see here in the yeah higher temperatures they are melting and one more dynamic application from food industry is for example the melting of chocolate so we could uh, we could our chip DC here and have different fats that are melting at different temperatures. And so this is also something for the investigation for quality control or uh, research, for example. Uh, but they are not just dynamic applications. So it's also possible to perform quasi isothermal application, of course. And so an example for this could be on the one hand, a UV curing investigation, for example, if you want to get to know, okay, what's the curing, the best curing condition for uh, for my epoxy resin or something like this, but also for uh, some stability application, like you can see here on the right hand side. Uh, in this case, it was on uh, a clay mineral with uh, different colorful additives and uh, this was something we want to determine okay what about uh, the thermal stability of our uh, colorful additive here and so this could be an indicator uh, not just for the material itself but the practical use at the end could be also for example things like the storage conditions production issues and uh, of course also thermal stress uh, if you use it in construction or something like this. And through these isothermal steps in combination with the camera system here in this case, it is possible to investigate the influence of uh, these yeah, stresses, for example, uh, uh, thermal stress or something like this. And of course, it's also possible to perform this uh, during um, uh, dynamic dynamic uh, measurement but sometimes uh, these reactions and these changes uh, of the color uh, take some time so therefore it could be helpful uh, to use a quasi isothermal temperature profile like you can see here uh, and then one more dynamic application here because we need it later for the isothermal application so this is the oot test you can see here on the right hand side uh, this is the OOT of LDPE, so low density uh, polyethylene. And uh, the atmosphere was uh, pure oxygen. And so this was a dynamic run just to see when does the uh, sample starts to oxidize. And uh, this investigation is part of the DIN in ISO 11357-6. And so there are different conditions for OIT and OOT tests. And we need this temperature to determine the starting temperature for the next investigation. And this is the isothermal application you can see here. Uh, so uh, the temperature profile, uh, yeah, is you heat up to a specific temperature, uh, for example, 200 degrees for polyethylene, and uh, then um, everything under nitrogen or any inert gas. And so, Therefore, then you start the oxygen flow. And through this, uh, it takes a while until the uh, oxidation starts. And here in this example, we have the different oils again. And we can see, OK, under the really same measurement conditions, we have different starting times for the oxidation. And this is something you can determine with an isothermal application like this. And of course, also, this is from the norm. And uh, for gases, you can use, for example, air or oxygen. And for the crucibles, it's also possible to use special crucibles made of copper. And uh, yeah, this is how it works. So, okay, we have a dynamic measurement, we have quasi isothermal measurements, and we have oscillating application. Uh, so the oscillating application here we use mostly for CT measurements. So this is something you can see here, the specific heat capacity. So this means how much heat can be stored uh, by a sample at a specific temperature. So this is quite helpful if you need any uh, information about this. Don't wonder about the peak here at around about 250 degrees. So this is again PET. And 
uh, the CP, so the specific heat, isn't defined uh, during the melting because the melting is an uh, endothermic effect. And through this, it looks like there's a big CP for a measurement system. But of course, it's just defined there. Um, yeah, so this is how we receive this. So with chip DSC, we are using uh, temperature modulation only. So the raw signal you receive uh, from our measurement system here with temperature modulation is uh, the measurement you can see here at the bottom. And what we can see there, okay, uh, the amplitudes of our signal are getting higher here at around about 80 degrees or 75. And then we have uh, the same amplitude uh, at around about 150 degrees, uh, but there's a bump here, and the amplitude gets really big at around about 250 or 240 degrees. And so on the top, we can see the result for our CP measurements. So we have the glass, and uh, during the glass transition, the specific volume of our sample expands. At we can see uh, uh, the step here, our CP signal. And of course, we have again the melting here with a maximum at 243 degrees Celsius. And this is what we receive with the chip DSC. Why is this? Because we can uh, receive some additional information regarding this, because it's possible to split a DSC signal to non reversing. Uh, heat flow, the total heat flow, so that's more or less our standard DSC signal, and the reversing heat flow. So this is something you can see here. Uh, so we have two transitions here, the non-reversing heat flow with an exothermic character. Uh, we have the total heat flow for the PET, again, with the glass transition, the recrystallization, and the melting. And we have the very reversing heat flow just with the glass transition and the melting. And this is pretty helpful because when we perform this with our DSC, uh, we yeah, have the additional information about the CP you can see here at the top. But we have also the reversing and non-reversing heat flow. And what's interesting here, of course, we can see, okay, the reversing heat flow is just the flipped CP signal more or less, uh, but we have some additional information here uh, at the non-reversing heat flow. And on the one hand, this is the overlaying peak, so the hysteresis uh, or relaxation peak uh, at the same temperature like the glass transition. Of course, we have the non-reversing recrystallization because this depends really on the cooling conditions of our sample. And we can see here a second exothermic effect uh, during the melting. And uh, from literature, this is called crystal perfection. And this is also pretty interesting because with a conventional DSC measurement, we don't have any chance uh, to see this peak here. Uh, let's come to the Raman spectroscopy. So of course, this is the second uh, part we need for our investigations we want to talk about uh, today. And so uh, the Raman spectroscopy is a technique uh, for studying the molecules and their structure and dynamics. So the movement of, of my molecules and so on. So uh, we are using light, in our case, of course, laser light, to uh, examine the chemical bonds we can find in our sample here. And this directly gives us information about the uh, chemical composition without any decomposition. And this is pretty important because uh, like an MS or something like this, we have to change. Uh, yeah, uh, it's not possible to use this uh, in, a, in a solid state, uh, but we have to change it. And yeah, that's really helpful here with the Raman spectroscopy because we can use it on one hand on a solid, but also on a liquid and so on. So some things about history, the Raman effect itself was already predicted in 1923 uh, by Mrs. Mikal. And finally discovered was this effect, of course, by Mr. Raman. And he also received uh, the Nobel Prize in 1930 uh, for his work and the discovery of this Raman effect. 
And uh, initially, these Raman spectrometers are, yeah, not that smart like they are now, uh, because they were really big and uh, really, really expensive. And uh, through lasers, new semiconductors, detectors, and sensitive amplifiers, now the Raman spectroscopy is an affordable and really powerful tool. And what can we see with the Raman spectro? Uh, Raman spectroscopy. So uh, we have the Raman scattered light, uh, which changes the wavelength, and uh, that of course through the interaction of our laser light interacting with my samples, so with the molecules and their movement. And so our Raman spectrometer has to be really sensitive because uh, around about 99.99% of my laser light just passes through the sample. And then there's a, a small amount of laser light that's elastically scattered. And this is the so-called Rayleigh scattering. And yeah, a really, really small part here is inelastically scattered. And this is the Raman scattering, so it's really small uh, and the amount of uh, light that comes back inelastically scattered is really small so it's really important to have a sensitive detector here so the raman spectrometer itself would look like more or less like this so of course we have the laser uh, with some op optics after that and then we shoot with our laser light on our sample and then uh, Again, uh, through some optics, we uh, lead the Raman scattered light uh, directly to our detector, and then we need a computer to uh, for the data acquisition. And of course, uh, there's much more inside a Raman spectrometer, but that's nothing we wanted to discuss today. Um, because let's have a look on some examples we can receive with the Raman spectrometer we are using from Wasage Photonics. And so one example here could be HTPE, so the high density polyethylene. Uh, polyethylene itself is the most used uh, polymer worldwide. And so it's mostly used for, for bottles. And uh, yeah, why do we use HTPE? Uh, because of its, uh, the higher density leads to more stability of my bottle or something like this. And what we can see here um, on the wave number is we have uh, some huge peaks here uh, from the CC stretch at around about 1,100 per centimeter wave number, the CH2 twist at 1,300 and the CH2 band at 1,400 per centimeter. And yeah, maybe directly check the second example. And here we have the LDPE. And we realize it looks more or less like the same because uh, both of this is uh, polyethylene. And in this case, it's just the low density poly polyethylene mostly used for foils or food packaging due to the higher flexibility. Uh, flexibility. And of course, also, the specific groups here are really the same. And yeah, so this is something we can see here for LDPE and HDPE. There are no big differences we can see through our Raman spectrometer. On the other hand, of course, we have some other polymers like polypropylene. That's the second most used polymer with a higher mechanical and uh, yeah, temperature resistivity. So here we have different uh, groups like the CCC stretch. And, but also here we have sometimes the same groups because of course all of them are polymers. And so also here, it could be sometimes hard uh, to determine the differences, but for example, the CCC stretch here at around about 800 per centimeter wave number uh, is a good indicator for this uh, sample. And last but not least, we are talking about PET all the time when we evaluate polymers uh, by DSC. So of course, we also have a measurement here for polyethylene terephthalate. And also this is a yeah, really often used uh, polymer, for example, in bottles and so on. And here we can see, here we have really different uh, groups. We can see here marked with 
the errors. And this is the PET example, but maybe sometimes we should prove if our results with a match to the temperature and of course also this matches. So to be honest, I, we don't have any idea about the measurement conditions of this literature value here. Uh, we can see uh, the orange uh, spec uh, spectrum we can see here, but even through this, we have a really good correlation of more than 92%. And this was uh, provided by publicspectra.com. And so we can say, yeah, this works uh, totally fine. Our PET is really PET. Now, today we want to talk about the combined investigation uh, for Raman spectroscopy and DSC. So, of course, we have to combine it in any way. And thanks to our uh, chip design of the chip DSC, it's really easy to adapt, uh, especially optical attachments to our devices. So on one hand, of course, we need the chip DSC itself. So the easy to use calculator with many options. And we don't need, need the glass dome anymore, of course, because we need an adapter here uh, that combines the measurement cell of our DSC with the detector of our spectrometer. Additionally, we also have a camera here uh, just to check if the laser is directly uh, on a sample. So this is also something we can see on our uh, in our software here. And of course, we need the Raman spectrometer itself. And yeah, thanks to newer components, it's now affordable. And also with a pretty small footprint like the chip DSC of 20 per 20 centimeters. So this is now the adapter with the chip DSC itself. We have the detector, the camera, and of course, a safety lock because we are using lasers here uh, on the adapter itself. The DSC main device, of course, with measurement cell, the sensor itself with the included heater, and in the main housing, then we have the data acquisition and electronics for everything. And uh, then we also have the Raman main device uh, with a cooling system. And of course, we have the laser and detector and the data acquisition also there. So this is uh, how the spectrometer looks like that we are using. As I mentioned, it's uh, from Wasage Photonics and it works pretty well for the chip DSC. And of course, it's also smart. It's the same size like the chip DSC. So uh, you will find a place in every lab therefore. And regarding the software, I have to say we are using here two separate software solution mainly because uh, with our DSC, we are working time dependent and temperature dependent. And of course, the spectrometer works uh, over the wavelength or the wave number. And so therefore we separate this because uh, we have many different yeah, options and needs here in these softwares. And uh, so with the Enlighten software from Wasage Photonics, we have several settings you can see here in the bottom, uh, like detect detector control, the uh, X axis you want to use. Uh, as I mentioned, you can use wave number, so the Raman shift, or on the other hand, the wavelength. And then you can also smooth there through the software. You have uh, different baseline correction functions you can use here. And of course, we also have a temperature control to have a good reference here. And of course, what's also really important uh, for further uh, evaluation and investigation, uh, sometimes it's needed to use another software. Of course, uh, with Linsight software and Enlighten software, it's easily possible to export the values and also to perform some batch measurements. So this is now our software here from Linsight. So our software is uh, split it into three parts. We have the administration software you can use to uh, yeah, add new devices or new gases you want to use as atmosphere, or for example, to add some materials to the database uh, you want to compare with. And on the other hand, we have the uh, measurement software itself where you can uh, set up the general settings like name, weight, and so on. And of course, also, 
um, the temperature profile we need here. And with our evaluation software, where we evaluate all of our measurements, doesn't matter if it's a dilatometer or a, a DSC or a TGA, everything you can perform in one software. Of course, we want to combine this with our Raman spectrometer, and this is how you can perform it. So you have the PET measurement, for example, and here you can add now uh, the view of your uh, Raman spectrum and also here in our software it's possible to, to compare it and to uh, see the changes of your spectrum here. So now I talked about the results from our Raman spectrometer and also the results from our DSC. Of course, now we need uh, some application. Why should we combine it? And uh, so the combination of Raman and DSC is uh, pretty powerful. And what we have here, I already talked about HTP and LDPE. And yeah, we have the really same specific groups here we can see. And so it's pretty hard to uh, figure out if it's HTPE or LDPE. And uh, the only differences we can see here is a bit uh, peak have uh, over the wave number and the baseline differs due to uh, slightly different settings here in this case. And uh, so maybe check the DSC, what we can see here. And with DSC, it is possible uh, to uh, distinguish uh, an HDPE from an LDPE. But if we have really broad peaks and a high heating rate or a bad sample preparation. Also here, it could be hard to determine the differences. So it is pretty powerful and we have a better idea. And the peak maximum we want to evaluate here differs through uh, 10 to 20 degrees. But sometimes it's not that hard, especially if we have some additives inside and so on. And Therefore, of course, we have another application we can use. I explained before, for example, the OIT test. So here we can see the result uh, of the OIT of L uh, LDPE. Sorry. And we have the melting here during the heating ramp. And then we have the isothermal step. And all in all, after 19.6 minutes, we have the uh, exothermic reaction of our LDPE. So the oxidation starts there. And on the other hand, we have the HDPE, we can see here. And what we can see here, the time scale is much bigger, but there's no exothermic uh, reaction we can see here um, uh, on our DSC signal. So this is a yeah, really often used method to uh, determine and distinguish LDPE and HDPE. That could be pretty helpful. On the other hand, uh, for example, we want to separate some uh, really close uh, polymers like polypropylene and polyethylene. As you can see here in the red measurement, normally it's pretty easy to separate polyethylene and polypropylene. Uh, but uh, through additives, uh, the copolymer or some other integrants, uh, it could be hard. And uh, for example, you use a really high heating rate. It's possible. Uh, it's not, yeah, so easy to uh, distinguish uh, between polyethylene and polypropylene because uh, the peaks are overlaying again. And therefore, the uh, Raman spectrometer helps us. Of course, we have sometimes the same peaks like here at 1450, but uh, there are some specific. Uh, yeah, peaks we can see here in our spectrum at around about uh, 800. You can see here from our polypropylene. So it's a good fingerprint. Uh, so it's easy to separate our samples here. And this is how the uh, spectrum helps us. Of course, it's also possible to combine this with a dynamic investigation, like you can see here. In this case, we are using polyethylene terephthalate and want to figure out the changes through the crystallinity uh, during this exothermic transition. 
here. So it could be pretty helpful. For example, if you have an unknown material and you want to figure out, okay, what's what's the reason for this uh, for this peak or for this transition we can see here on our DSC signal, then Raman spectroscopy can help us here to figure out, yeah, where this uh, peak or transition comes from. So on the top, we can see here the literature uh, for uh, less crystalline uh, example at lower temperature. Uh, that's the blue, uh, the blue spectrum, and the red one uh, with a higher, uh, with a higher crystallinity. And what we can see there is they are not so big uh, changes because, of course, it's the really same material. Uh, but uh, the movement changed, and through this, we have a shifted peak at around about 990 per centimeter and a different peak form here at 1100 per centimeter. And of course, after the melting, these changes will disappear again because then, of course, we have a different crystallinity here after the melting. And this is what we can see. Also with our measurement here for our Raman spectrometer. So we have, I've marked that with uh, these two arrows at 160 degrees Celsius and 215 degrees Celsius. We have uh, the shifted peak at around about 990 per centimeter and the peak form at 1100 per centimeter changed a lot. So this is how we can prove the character of the transition of the recrystal recrystallization in this case of our PET. So of course it's important for us uh, to compare between uh, different yeah investigations or materials, and sometimes we don't want to figure out all of the specific groups we can find in our spectrum, and therefore we are currently working on our own data by database that combines uh, the DSC values. That's more or less common practice, but we combine it here with our Raman spectrums. And so this is a more powerful database with additional information about the character of the transition and so on. So of course, this database is user expandable like every database we offer. Uh, so if you need another temperature, uh, different temperature profiles or materials and conditions, of course, you can add them by yourself directly to our database. And uh, the reference materials, as I mentioned, are currently investigated and measured by our partner. Uh, he's using the chip DSC and in combination with the wattage photonics uh, Raman spectrometer. So that's uh, so far everything and all from my side. Uh